Hey everyone, welcome to Critical Faculty. Today, we are going to be talking Islam and the state of women in Islam. And I've got just the right person who's been through hell and back talking about her uh, story and many other women's story in, uh, in the stronghold of Islam. Please join me in welcoming uh, Yasmin Muhammad. Hello, Yasmin, how are you? Good, good, Hani. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you. I'm so honored to have you. And uh, I can't wait to hear your story and to hear the great work you do for other people who are experiencing what you've had to go through in life. Um, I want to start by asking you a question about the, your, your, the point where you thought Islam wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't from God, wasn't the real religion that you thought it was. When was that? When did the penny drop? So it was, I was in university and I was taking a course called History of Religions. Um, and the course was being taught by a Lebanese Christian man. Well, he was Christian at the time. He was, he grew up Christian, but he was an atheist. Um, and while I was in that course where, because he was an Arab and I felt close to him and comfortable, criticizing Islam with him and he's showing me all these parts of a hadith that uh, I was not aware of before, like the whole drinking camel pee and things like that. I was like, whoa, and showing me about how the earth is flat from the Quran. And so it was my very first opportunity to be able to look at the Quran and at the hadith and to actually um, you know, like criticize it, like use my critical thinking skills for the first time. And because it was an academic environment, it was safe. And of course, going to Islamic schools my whole life, there's no way you can ask the simplest question, right? You get in trouble for it. That's the shaitan in your ear. That's the mm -hmm. devil in your ear. Um, so while I was in that course, taking that class, 9-11 happened. Oh, wow. So... I was essentially, I was bombarded both, you know, intellectually and emotionally because, you know, uh, I was married to a terrorist, a member of Al Qaeda. So I knew that this was not like outside of the realm of Islam and as Muslims are actually peaceful and these are just a small group of terrorists. Like I knew that it was all about jihad and um, I was going to the mosque and like my community and my home and everybody was celebrating, you know, we have conquered the infidels and, you know, I'm, I remember this conversation. It's so vivid in my mind that I remember exactly where I was standing in the house and what I was staring at when I was talking to my mom, because I couldn't even look at her when I was saying to her, but, but there was a daycare in that building like do you not even care about those children and she's like it's fine they're gonna go to heaven they're kids and i'm like but what about their families what about their parents that now their kids are gone like you know and did you see the people jumping from the building it doesn't matter they're kofar they don't they you know what i mean like it was just i couldn't reconcile like it was it was so difficult for me to believe that I was part of this group. I was part of this community. I was part of this belief system. I was part of this family that was celebrating something so atrocious. Um, so yeah, there was both, both my brain and my heart were being bombarded at the same time. And I, it, it was really like a sweater unraveling. It just was just a really pretty quick unravel um, after that happened. Right. I've had a look at your, um, your, your mixed background, uh, uh, Egyptian mother, Palestinian father, um, obviously with the father being of a very strict background, we're talking about Al-Qaeda there. So we're talking about a, a very strict version of Islam. It's not just your normal, regular Muslim we're talking about. So my father wasn't Al-Qaeda. My father was like a, a sorry, nominally... That's, that's the husband later on, sorry, uh, my mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the man that they made me marry um, because they tried to marry me off to my cousin. Like I was I was this girl that was unwilling to submit 
right? As per the definition of Islam, I wouldn't conform. And so my mother said that they chose a man who was strong enough to control me. So yeah, uh -huh. he was a terrorist. Oh, really? So they've done that on purpose. They, they chose somebody who they knew, uh, a strict Muslim at least. Did they actually know he was Al-Qaeda member? Yes, they yeah. did. I knew. My goodness. Right. Yeah. And we're talking about this is 2001. So this is where Al-Qaeda was, was um, uh, we kind of knew that the kind of atrocities they're committing around the world. Um, uh, and uh, both your father and mother were Sunni Muslim and very, very practicing pious religious Muslims as well? So my parents um, actually got divorced when I was like still in utero. My mom was still pregnant with me. And right. by the time I was two years old, my dad had moved across the country. So I'm from Canada, very, very large country. I was living in Vancouver and he moved to Montreal, which is yes. like a six hour plane ride away. So mm. he might as well have been on the moon. He was just very far away from us. Um, and my mom made it very difficult for him to come visit us. So like I said, he was nominally Muslim. As a Palestinian, he was viciously anti-Semitic, but he wasn't really religious. Right. Um, no, he had girlfriends, he drank, he smoked pot, he lived his life comfortably. But And him and my mom, when they were together, were both very secular Muslims, like neither of them practiced or prayed or anything, or it wasn't even being a Muslim was just like saying I'm Egyptian. Like it was just a, a label, yeah. but they didn't do anything, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but what happened when my parents got divorced is that my mom was left alone um, with three kids. Cause I was the youngest of three and they had originally been living in San Francisco. And so they moved to Canada and they weren't in Canada very long before they got divorced. And so my mom just felt completely alone, completely isolated. She didn't have community. She didn't have friends. And so she went to the mosque looking for support, looking for community, looking for, I think, just other Arabic speaking women, maybe like to, to connect with. She wasn't looking for religion per se, but that's what she found there. The guy that was <clears throat> living in the mosque, um, a Salafi Egyptian man who was already married, already had three kids. He basically took my mom as his second wife. So, you know, in Islam, a man can have up to four wives, even though it's illegal in Canada. His first mm -hmm. wife was his legal wife. And my mom was just his, you know, extra, his Islamically mm -hmm. married wife. But she had no legal um uh, no legal rights as a wife. And uh, that's when it all started, right? That's when it, he put her in hijab. He made us start praying. He started breaking all of her records, saying music is haram. Um, we were no longer allowed to, or my sister and I were no longer allowed to ride bikes. We're no longer allowed to go swimming. Birthday parties are haram. Like just everything is haram. Haram, 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 haram. And so... Um, yeah, I was about five or six years old when that happened. So my life changed completely. And uh, by the time I was nine, I was in an Islamic school. And there's nothing you can do as a kid to fight against this, you know, this new totalitarian system that has taken over your family. My mom wasn't resisting by any means. Um, and she just actually, she became the most zealous, I call her a born again Muslim, because people understand what a born again Christian acts like. Mm -hmm. And that's what my mom acted like. She just dove deep into all of the Ikhwan stuff. And then soon after that, the Ikhwan weren't even good enough. And she was right up into the, into the basically, um, you know, she just really wanted to conquer <laughs> The West and get rid of all the infidels, and that's just where everything that she ever did was with that thought in mind. She was just very, very committed, very angry. It must be quite conflicting to live in a society like Canada. So you you, you kind of glimpse mm -hmm. at uh, the liberty that everybody or your peers are having, while you're completely isolated. Growing up, how did you feel about that isolation? Well, I felt. Envy. 
<laughs> I would look to the to the to the girls who weren't born Muslim and who weren't living under these, you know, under Sharia law. Um, and I would feel like I'm missing out on life. Like I wished that I, I wanted to play sports so bad. Like I just, that was one of my biggest things growing up. Like I just, I wanted to run, but you're wearing a hijab and abaya. Like you're just, you're wrapped up and you're not like the bicycle. The reason why we couldn't ride bikes is because they're afraid you're going to break your hymen and then you won't be a virgin anymore. Like they treat us, they wrap us up in like cotton. I say that they raised us like veal, you know, like you can't move, you can't, everything is just, it's just about being, keeping you pure and clean. And, you know, you learn to cook and clean and things in the house, but I could never, like, I just want able to run on the beach you see people running on the beach mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm like what would that feel like with your feet in the sand and in the water and the wind in your hair like i was constantly feeling like that feeling like i'm missing out on on my life um so i was stuck in this in between my mom hated everything to do with Canada, everything to do with liberalism, everything to do with freedom. And she was just constantly going on and on and on and on how, about how much she hated everything. And it never made sense to me. I was always like, why are you here? You have family in Egypt. You, we can go live with, you know, go live in Egypt. You're from Egypt, you're an Egyptian citizen. Like, why are you in this country? And then hating them so much. Like, it just didn't make any sense to me why she would put herself through that kind of trauma. Like, I, I wouldn't want to live in China, so I'm not going to go live there and then just, like, complain all the time. <laughs> like, just don't go there. Um, so she never made any sense to me. And I never really, I never bought into the hate that she had because I was always looking to watching things like, family ties and the Cosby show and even Roseanne and all of those shows. And you're thinking like, is that how people live? Like, is that how parents talk to their children? <laughs> is this, you know, like it's just so much um, coveting of that world. Um, and so, yeah, I, I never thought that I would ever be free because I used to believe that being Muslim was part of your identity. It's who you are. I didn't realize that it's a set of ideas that you can discard because when you're raised Muslim, you're told, you know, they make statements like, oh, just because you're born in a barn doesn't make you a horse. Just because you're born in Canada doesn't make you Canadian. Just because you're born in England doesn't make you British. So you always have to think of yourself as a stranger in a strange land. Um, and you are, because of course I don't fit in with the Canadian society by any means, any stretch of the imagination. Not by uh, choice, I just mean, it's the way you're brought up, right? Not by choice. Yeah. It could have been and also our been. lives, yeah. our lives are so different. Like the friends that I had were understanding and empathetic and caring, but they can't fathom mm. my life. And in some ways I have a better understanding of their life because it's the whole society, but they, all they all they hear are my words. And so you don't really talk because you sound like a crazy person. Like it doesn't, if there's no, like, how do you, it doesn't, it doesn't even make sense. You know what I mean? Like they can't even comprehend it. Completely foreign. It's whatever you're going to say is going to sound too foreign. foreign. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's and, I, and I'm going to ask you, uh, and please, I mean, if it's too personal, you don't have to answer, but do you still have a relationship with your mother? No. Um, when I took off my hijab, I still was a Muslim, but I had taken off my hijab and she said, she said, if you take off your hijab, the next step is that you're going to leave Islam. So I have to make sure that you're killed before you do that. Because... Are you no, I'm not joking. She said it so matter of factly, so sure of herself, so definitive. Um, because I am not going to suffer for eternity for raising 
a non-believing daughter. Like I'm not going to be punished for because of your sins. And so I'll make sure that you're killed before that happens. It was like a promise. And so I had a daughter at that time. My daughter and I both just, we just, we moved out of the place we were living in. We changed our names or I changed her name. Um, and we had no, we've had no contact with her since. I just don't know what to say. This is incredible. Now, only, only uh, belief without evidence can do that to, uh, to a person, you know, to, to, to empty you from the strongest of connection, mother, daughter, um, for this to happen. Uh, but, but, I mean, they, but they see that as a virtue, right? Because they look at Abraham and how he was willing to kill his son. And so they think of it as this is a pious, good, I am a good mother for doing this because I am choosing a law over you. Oh, it's incredible. Uh, but I'm glad that you've never looked back and you moved on uh, and, and not just moved on, moved on to to help so many others. And while you're, I'm going to ask you a question while you're, you're responding, I'm going to display your wonderful YouTube channel where you are helping and your foundation is helping so many uh, on uh, forgotten feminists, uh, the, all these females who've been, and even ex-Christians and not just Muslims, but people from all walks of life come to you for help and you help them to finally be themselves. Mm -hmm. The only natural thing you can do. <laughs> yeah. Um, my question to you, um, every time, it, it must feel so good and, and so um, redemptive uh, that you help people out uh, uh, and, and help them to a safe shore. Is, is this something that you're really now motivated by, something that makes you wake up in the morning? Yeah, it's absolutely healing. Um, I have to say that the trigger was survivor's guilt. Um, when you've been through that and you know how close you were, not just my mother, but also having... Um, my ex being a member of Al Qaeda, I don't know where his friends are. You know, I knew he was in prison, but I didn't know, like, he could be sending people after me and my daughter. So we lived in, in fear for a very long time. And I feel now like, you know, the stories of honor violence, the stories of honor killings, they're constant. They're, they're just, you can't keep up. And there are so many girls like me who just made it by the skin of our teeth. Like if not for the flap of a butterfly's wing somewhere, we would also be buried in a backyard somewhere. And so it's that feeling of being unseen, unheard, um, but then surviving it and knowing that there are millions of other girls out there unseen, unheard. And it makes you feel like, well, I must survive for a reason. Like I have to do something with this. I can't just go ahead and enjoy my free life and completely ignore the fact that all of these women exist living the same life that I used to live. So you're compelled to do it. Um, yeah, it is. It is definitely very healing, though, for sure, because um, every single person that I reach and that who tells me reading your story was like reading my story or, you know, coming and sharing my story on Forgotten Feminists, like I can finally be my authentic self for the first time. It does make you feel like all of this re-triggering, all of this re-trauma is worth it you know something positive is coming out of you know one of the most one of the darkest parts of humanity and in a second i'm going to also display your, your uh, free hearts free minds um foundation and if you can tell us a little bit about the work you do as well uh, in that regard um be wonderful thank you yeah so free hearts free minds was born because when I was going through this whole process, I was completely isolated. I didn't even know there were other people in the world who had left Islam because I'd never met them, never heard about them, didn't know that they existed. Um, or if, you know, if they did exist, they'd, they'd be killed already. And so 
what got me through that dark time was number one, therapy. And number two, a community, finding a community through social media, finally. And so that's what I am trying to build with, or that is what I have built with my organization. It offers both therapy and community. So each person uh, that joins gets 12 sessions, both group and individual therapy, um, as well as a community of other people who have left Islam from all over the world. And now you have a community of chosen family that love you for who you are, for your authentic self, not for this persona that you have to create in order to be accepted um, by the world around you, you know? So it, it's not conditional. Um, and yeah, I'm very, very proud of it. I work with amazing people who make me so grateful that I have found them in this world. They're not uh, doing this just like as a job because obviously we're a nonprofit. So we're constantly struggling to, to make ends meet. We currently have a waiting list of over 40 people, um, but we can only take groups of five at a time. So um, and we can't do concurrent groups because we just don't have the funding for it. So we're, we're constantly in this state of not being able to do as much as we'd like to do because we're restricted by funding. But um, like I said, I'm very grateful to be working with people who are as committed to this organization as I am. You know, they're passionate about changing the world and helping people. And uh, so, yeah, I'm very, I'm very, very proud of my organization. And please, folks, um, you are very much encouraged uh, to go to that website and, and donate, make a donation. This is this is wonderful work happening here. Uh, this is all for not non for profit. This is uh, to support fellow human beings who are trying to just to be themselves. I mean, I mean, this is something that I've struggled with in, in terms of religion. Uh, throughout my life is is the Abrahamic God had it in for women from the very start. You know, the uh, Eve made Adam, the grown-up dude. Uh, he actually, it was very funny when you read the Old Testament. Um, God said, uh, first of all, for an omniscient God, uh, he, said, he said to Adam and Eve, where, where, where are you? <laughs> like, supposed to be... <laughs> they were hiding from him. Um, and then... <laughs> They appear from behind the bushes, and uh, Adam, first thing he said, he said, well, the woman you created for me made me eat from the forbidden fruit, so you were blamed from day one for the, for the fall of all humans. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, and, and you were an afterthought, you know, like, so Adam was created first, and God was happy with that, but then he saw him quite alone and you know bored and you know also yeah. let, let's create him a toy to play with yes you know? <laughs> that, is, so and that is still that is still how it's such a pervasive thing how so many of these religious men truly do think that women hmm. have been created for them like we are a thing for their pleasure consumption use you know property like they just they cannot think of us they cannot imagine that women are actually full autonomous human beings <laughs> you know we weren't created for anyone's use for anyone's service and, and it's 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 uh, i think the arabic word is uh, uh, which means a, a, a warped rip that needs to be straight straightened so this is where you created yeah. from and and you got to be straightened because women Somehow, in their nature, uh, they're, 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 they're the reason everybody errs, the reason why uh, your prayer might not be heard from by God. All the, you know, you're the, you are the cause for of every single evil act committed by men. We are quite innocent, you know, we're just idiots uh, chasing butterflies. And, and then you guys happen to be around and we're like, we're distracted. We don't know what to do. We can't contain ourselves. <laughs> so perfect. Exactly. Men are complete fucking idiots that they can't do anything they need. But then at the same time, it's like, and also men are responsible and control women because they are the, they are the smarter, like, like, like Muhammad says, you know, women are less intelligent. 
Uh, so women can't be leaders, you know, but at the same time, you're talking about men as if they're this useless, dumb thing that can't even control his penis around women. He needs women to cover themselves head to toe in black. Otherwise, he's going to rape them because what's he going to do? It's in his nature, you know. So that infantil, you know, treating men as if they're these dumb little babies is Ooh. insulting to men. Absolutely. <laughs> this whole religious thing is like you're both treating the men and the women in a in a very derisive manner. And it's, uh, yeah, it's it's really sad. It screws up with sexuality. It actually ends up with with generations of screwed up sexuality there. They can't express them properly. It's suppressed. You ended up with concubine on the sides and uh, Callum Stein's affairs and all sorts of things because you cannot do what you really want to do with your wife. You've got to have somebody else. Uh, I remember one of the... Um, uh, the mafia, it's an, and, and some of the other cultures, which is very uh, masculine, dominate like the Italian in the Mediterranean. You know, when they uh, talk about um, a, a mafia boss, and you say, well, you know, uh, and the wife, and the, what about oral sex? And so I'm not going to do that to the mouth that kisses my children. You know, yeah. and it's incredible what, how men think about things like that, but they can still do them, but elsewhere. And this is where you get a, the twisted sex sexuality. Uh, to the point where the very forbidden things in this life are the reward for the afterlife. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, and and, and, and is it raisins or grapes? <laughs> that <was> yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's some Islamic apologists are trying to say that that uh, which are the sex dolls in heaven that the men get seventy two of them. They're like, no, no, no. It's uh, it's, it's it's not it's not a woman sex slave. It's uh it's raisins or it's grapes. This is these men are blowing themselves up so they can get seventy two grapes in heaven. Meanwhile, there's actual a hadith where they describe in detail the women's skin, their breasts, their eyes, the fact that they don't menstruate, the fact that they don't talk back, the fact that they don't have any human bodily functions. Like they've taken basically like a, they've made her. They've taken a woman and they've dehumanized her even further more than they could do on earth. You know what I mean? Like they've dehumanized us as far as they can on this planet, but in their imaginations, they've dehumanized us even more and, ma and made us into essentially sex toys. And that's what men, that is the, that is what they earn in heaven. And that goes back to that point that I was saying, they think of us as property or as things they, women are the thing that you get if you die for Sabilillah, if you die in jihad, if you die mm. for Allah. That's your, th this, it's like a thing. It's like, mm. I will give you 72 of this product, you know? And that's, all of this shapes how they think of women. It's, we're just a thing that needs to be covered up until they are ready to be handed over to their husband so that he can use them as he wants. And then that's it. She has no other purpose in the world. Keep her in the home, keep her covered. That's it. She cooks, she cleans, and he can rape her whenever he feels like it because she's not allowed to say no. Mm -hmm. And he can beat her whenever he feels like it too, because Allah has given him that permission. Yeah. That's the life of a woman under Islam. Otherwise, there are some dudes made of light up upstairs will be their job description is they're uh, uh, senior cursors. They, they just curse. Yes. Yep. Overnight. All night long. That's that's what they're. So uh, an angel would be created just to, it's like, what are you doing up there? I'm, I'm just cursing women who um, refuse to sleep with their husbands. This is incredible. And that's an all wise uh, thing there, up there. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. incredible. Uh, the the um, I was still thinking about the raisins thing and the grapes. There is an Egyptian um, term for certain types of grapes called Aina Benati. Uh, oh, really? You know that? You know one? It's crazy. It's a, it's got like a it's, a it's a lady's grapes. So there must be some connection of some sort uh, <laughs> happening here. There must be some. Yeah, they're, they're, it will end up being a scientific miracle. Somebody's actually going to say, we, we predicted six robots. 
we predicted so before it happened it's happening right now see what the quran is able to do yeah can you imagine <laughs> those guys going up to heaven expecting 72 virgins and they get here's a bowl of grapes <laughs> i hope it's real <laughs> Yeah, especially when they're trying to put their body parts uh, back together, you know, after being <laughs> exploded. It's like, hold on a second, you, you're forgotten your right arm is just down there. Um, you're, um, 49, 50, 51, 52 percent of the human population have always been female, male female ratio. Uh, prior to the Abrahamic religions, we're talking about. Uh, religions probably started about 10, 12,000 years ago. Well, the cultural civilizations, uh, but then femininity was it was very strong. It was revered. It was uh, 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 it was to do with the with the soil and agriculture. Uh, there was a lot. Because we make life. Yes, yes, and and men didn't have a clue. They even make didn't make the connection. They were taking part of this. They were having sex, but they weren't sure whether they actually part of this whole thing they think women were uh the, the, it's a sort of a miracle in there now we know better mm -hmm. we know yeah. that 50 percent of the society of the creative pro uh, productive power needs to work we've got challenges coming at us we've got climate that is going nuts there we've got so many things a country or a civilization that has its half of its population dormant is mm -hmm. bound to, be, to fail can you see that on the ground? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that was one of Christopher Hitchens's quotes when he was talking about women in the Islamic world. Um, is He was citing exactly that. Like, you know, a society, you your societies will fail. I mean, they are failing, but they will continue to fail. You will not progress. You will not succeed as long as you are suppressing 50% of your population. Um, yeah, that's a fact, but I have to say that, and I, I, I credit social media for this because when you are a woman, you know, I just posted about a, a, one of the participants of free hearts, free minds, one of our community was talking about how, when she was in grade one, her teacher told her that me, women are less intelligent than men. <clears throat> he said, you as a girl are always going to be less intelligent than the other boys in this class. At grade one, he was making sure that she understood this because it's a hadith. And when you say it's a hadith, say, you know, Sayyidina Muhammad said it, you can't question it. Halas, it's truth. So she has to accept that she's lesser than all the males in this class. And so when you are being raised in a society where you're constantly being told that you're inferior, you're constantly being told that you have no purpose other than in service of a man, whether it's to cook for him, to clean for him, to make babies for him, you're constantly being diminished, demoralized, dehumanized. Within you, there's a fire, you know, there is anger, there is resentment, I remember looking at the men around me going, what the fuck? I don't think I'm that smart, but I'm certainly smarter than these Neanderthals. Like there's no way, you know? And, but you can't say anything. You can't do anything. You have to just like, you internalize that you, it, you, you must be wrong because, you know, like it's in the Quran. Like we, we know this, like it has to be truth. It's from the almighty, all powerful God. Right. And so when you're raised in a society like that and you question it and you get angry about it, you can't do anything about it. It can't leave your mouth. It can't, you just stays in your head. It stays in your body. What social media has allowed us to do is to be able to get these ideas out. And even when I speak to Iranian women, and Iran is not a religious country, even though they are ruled by an Islamic regime, there even they couldn't speak. So just imagine in Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Somalia and everywhere else, right? So social media allowed them to be able to speak anonymously, post pictures of themselves without hijab, mm -hmm. talk about how much they want freedom. And suddenly they realized, whoa, look at all these other women who also feel the same way I do. 
And it was the first time that we could see each other and that we knew each other existed. And that gave us power because it motivated us. Oh, it's not just me. I'm not just this crazy person fighting by myself in my own head. There's like women all over the world that agree with me and that believe the same things and that feel the same things. And so we've had so many different campaigns. We've had Free From Hijab. We've had White Wednesdays. We've had, you know, there's so many of them. And those campaigns allowed us to see each other and hear each other and motivate each other and support each other. And obviously what's happening in Iran is the most phenomenal of examples of how women ha have pushed past all of this misogynist religious garbage, <clears throat> even if it means risking their lives, but you're seeing it happen all over the Middle East and all over the Muslim world too. Like even in countries like Malaysia and Indonesia, you know, Pakistan, everywhere, everywhere you are seeing women push back, fight back, question, question again and again and again, not accepting the old answers that we used to get told before because you're one person fighting. But now you know you have a huge global army. And so you're more empowered. And we talk to each other online and we get arguments from each other online and we, you know, get support from each other online. And some things I never thought I would see in my lifetime, like women in Saudi Arabia burning their niqabs, burning their niqabs, stepping on the Quran and posting videos of these things. I'm just like, is this real life? Because even I thought that in those countries, the people that would fight against these beliefs would be very few and far between. There's just got to be a small number of women because we only ever see a small number. We only ever see the ones that end up going to prison, the women that tried to drive when driving was against the law and then got called terrorists and got thrown in prison. So we only ever see a teeny tiny sliver because all the rest are, <clears throat> you know, um, silenced out of fear. But social media allowed us to see that this is the majority of the women in all of these countries. And they are just like starving for this opportunity to be able to express themselves. And it's beautiful. I love it. I'm so happy to be seeing it. I'm so glad to be alive to see this. I mean, social media is toxic in so many ways, but this is this is like life world, world changing. Women are the future is female. <laughs> oh, I, I can't. I mean, I, I, I'm happy. I mean, you don't have to be a female, obviously, to be a feminist, uh, because what we were talking about is, is freeing. You've got two arms and one is bound and you want to free the other arm for the entire society to rise up. So I want the, I want my, a better society for tomorrow. And um, yeah. you, you've got to free uh, your, you, you know, your, your energy, your full energy and being represented within males and females. There are differences, you know, uh, natural. For, and this should be exploited. The differences, the subtle differences between men and women um, uh, can be exploited in a way that will better uh, societies. Um, Everybody. Everybody. Mm -hmm. However, um, uh, uh, you know, I mean, men aside, we know that they, they're, uh, they're brought up in the Middle East for the mother. You know, like if there is a family of and they have a daughter and, and a, a, a son. Uh, and it's time for a cup of tea. The son will be just sitting around, you know, after dinner. Who's going to do the washing? It's the girl. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. mother will encourage that. They actually start from the mother. It's it's the son. The son can go out and 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 smoke can do whatever, even within Islamic society. But the oh, the, the the expectations on a female are quite different. If a, if a boy has many multiple girlfriends, then he's the Don Juan. He's uh, and the mother would even brag about the boys. Like a look at every girl wants to have a piece of them. This happens to the girls. A different story altogether. So when do, where where do we start? How do we change mothers? Um, uh, the way they bring up uh, males in, in for future generations? Well, these women that I'm talking about now, when they become mothers, they will be different mothers than the mothers that we had. <laughs> That's for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the mothers that we had were brought up in such strict patriarchal societies 
that they felt that the only way that they could protect their daughters and let them uh, live safely in such a hostile environment for girls is to teach her to be submissive, is mm -hmm. to teach her to submit and to accept her fate. You know, I couldn't believe, because I've known Ayan for years, Ayan Hersieli, mm -hmm. and I've probably listened to everything she's ever talked about, obviously read all her books, but she was on Joe Rogan and she told a story that I'd never heard before. And I actually almost couldn't breathe when she was telling it because it was exactly what happened to me. Like I was just frozen. She was telling the story about how when she was a teenager and she was like talking with her friends and she's like, why do we put up with this? Why are we accepting this? You know, they, they, they cut our genitals. They sew us up. They choose the man that's going to rip open our, 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 wounds like they they, they ever, why are we why what did we do we just were born and all of a sudden we're just treated like such garbage in these societies and the her friends around her said to her you will only find peace if you just stop resisting stop fighting it just accept this is the world you can't change the world so the only way is to go with the flow and to live within this system that you are bound by. You have, there, you have no other options. You can continue to fight all you want, but all you're going to do is make yourself angry, make yourself depressed, and it won't serve any purpose. It's still going to happen. And I remember exactly feeling that exact same way and being told that exact same thing. You are in a tsunami and it is pulling you and there's all you can do is just succumb. I remember I was in an elevator with my mom. It had to be an elevator because of course, when the doors closed, I felt so claustrophobic mm -hmm. and I was talking to her and I said, you're telling me that in my religion, this man has the right to beat me and rape me and there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing I can say about it. And she said, no, you're his property. Do you think you're going to fight against Allah? Do you think that you're going to fight against the almighty creator of the universe? You have nothing. You are his. So just shut up, go get raped, go get beaten up and shut your fucking mouth. This is, this is how we are raised. And so I just, you know, now that we are going to be the mothers of the future generations of sons we are carrying all of that with us and we know that we will never treat our daughters the way we were treated by our mothers our mothers felt like they had no choice there's that quote about all um all evil stems from powerlessness or something like that. I, I know I'm getting that quote totally or wrong. Like but evil, like evil prevails when, when good people uh, do nothing. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's like yeah. another word. Yeah. yeah, but it's also that these women, these mothers of ours really felt completely powerless. And I'm not to excuse them in any way, shape or form because there were quite a few mothers out there that were able to protect their daughters, you know, my mom was not one of them, but there are some. Um, but they really did feel that the only power that they can get is through the patriarchy, through supporting the dominant, powerful culture, which was is very misogynist. Um, but we're not going to be like that. So hope for the future. Because there's obviously that sort of culture that says a woman in, in, in the Middle East is, is worth nothing without a man. You must have a man. Yes. Uh, in your yes. life, uh, preferably a husband. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, you, you'll be um, you'll, you'll have a very difficult life ahead of you. Um, and and maybe, there are, maybe there are elements. Of, uh, even if that's true, uh, I think it's the 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 I, I blame the society to make it horrible for a woman not to live life properly without without a man. They made it so that without a man, life is horrible, and therefore you're kind of compelled. So it's 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 a it's a vicious 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 cycle, uh, that it, yep. but it needs somebody like yourself or I am to say that's it, tsunami's coming. I'm gonna take it on. Bring it on. Yes. Uh, 
Yes. I, I love that. I, I love that. It's it's just so empowering, and I, I'm so grateful for for everything you're doing, Yasmin. And uh, this is this is wonderful work. I'm gonna take this tear this conversation a little bit away from that area, and I'm gonna talk about the the the, the modern landscape and, and and politics because some of the politics are now driving the way we deal with certain things. I love that you're. You've, you've told me off air that you, you it's been 20 years now. You've moved on from, you don't discuss the intricate theological differences. What you care about is the repercussions of beliefs on, on the ground. What actually exactly. does to people. And one of the things that it does to people is you want to talk about them. And then you've got two parties in North America, mainly in the US, the left and the right. Mm. And, and there's that conversation going on, but for some reason, and I remember it was made very, very clear in a conversation with Belmar uh, and Ben Affleck and Sam Harris, where uh, Islam is, is renowned to be the, the, the religion of, uh, of the brown people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're not so white. And these are a minority. And if you, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, attack the minority's belief, it's somehow attack on minorities. And the way we live... Mm -hmm. So in society today, this is something that we're, we should not encourage. And hence, Islamophobia, uh, which is the irrational fear and or, you know, uh, unfounded fear is, is, um, is, is designed and it's been exploited now so that Muslims will start using it every yeah. single time you're trying to point the finger and say, this is wrong. How do you circumvent that? It is so irrational that it really feels like a secular religion like it, mm. it arguing with people who have these supremely irrational thoughts it's like it's like trying to argue with an indoctrinated muslim person or trying to argue with somebody who believes in you know flat earth or, or like leprechauns or whatever unicorns like how do you have a conversation with somebody who is so out to lunch and i used to feel really really frustrated for a very long time because in my mind you are an educated individual and you are not indoctrinated by any religions so how is it that you cannot see this how is it that you can criticize homophobia this is the this is the this is the most clear example, right? You can criticize homophobia when it stems from the church, but when the homophobia and not just homophobia, but the full on like killing of gay people is happening in Muslim majority countries, so you culture. have nothing to say about it. Yeah, it's and if culture. you do say anything, it's their culture. Yeah, you'll never criticize it. So it's like, but. So if you're gay with white skin, then you should be protected and people should speak up for you. But if you're gay with brown skin, it's like, ah, sorry. You were born in the wrong ethnicity. You are born in the wrong family. Uganda, at the moment, I think Uganda is having a exactly. horrible attack on exactly. homosexuals. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And but, you know, they, they get stuck. They get stuck in this cognitive dissonance because they're being told, do not criticize anything from any cultures except for Western cultures, you know, must not. Anything else is, you know, xenophobia, racism, you know, blank phobia. And so you've got that, but at the same time, it's like, what about the way they're treating women? What about the way they're treating gay people? What about, what about, what about, what about, what about? You know, and they just, they can't reconcile those two. And I have to say overwhelmingly, especially after my podcast with Sam Harris, that's been the email that I've been getting is like, whoa, I never thought of it like that. I never saw it like that. You know, the, the point in my podcast with Sam that made me cry was when I was talking about how he was in his TED talk. He was talking about how we are so quick to criticize the, um, I want to call them the Westboro Baptist Church, but they're not. They're the, the Latter-day Saints, the, it's not. The Mormons. Jones. The Mormons, but like the, the 
Jeff Jeffrey. Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeff no. no, I want to say Dahmer too. <laughs> Dahmer came to my head. I don't know why. It's it's the guy. Well, he pretty much he's the guy who had like all of those wives, and they all wore pastel. Well, I know what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking about? That yeah. guy. So the FBI went in there, and they're like, "We got to protect these girls." And a lot of those girls were 10, 11, 12 years old. They were his wives, right? Mm -hmm. And those girls were taken into protection and they were told, no, you know, and they're like, I love my husband. And we're like, no, 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 honey, you have been indoctrinated. Come here, <laughs> you know. But when we look at girls in Afghanistan covered head to toe in that fucking beekeeper suit that they put on girls, it's their culture. They like it. They want to live that way. You know, what makes you think that a, a girl from Afghanistan and a girl from America are so inherently different? Do you mm. think that one is subhuman and the other one is human? Like what makes you not understand that girls in these countries are going to be that need to be protected just as much as girls in these countries? You know, like they just they really think of they forget that we're all on one planet and that we're all human beings, you know, and the same way you would feel or your sister or your wife or your girlfriend or your mother would feel if they were living in those societies, that's how the women in those societies feel, right? Because they are also human beings. They just have a different skin color. And that is the thing here is that these are the ones that call themselves anti-racist, but that's the most viciously racist way of looking at the world, you know? And so it, it, for a long, long time, I would make the argument of, you know, like I'm just doing with you now, this is rational, this is logical. How do you not see this? How do you not get this? But I just got exhausted. And I feel like sometimes people just don't care. They feel like it's none of my business. It's never going to affect me. It's never going to bother me. And to be honest, things like what happened with the um, with all of the rape gangs in the UK, and it's happening in Sweden and Germany and in Greece and in India and in Canada, same things. Now people are starting to realize, uh-oh, our daughters are now going to be victimized by these men as well. Now they've perked up. Mm -hmm. Now they're starting to pay attention. It just was too far from home before, I think. They were like, Afghanistan is so far away. Saudi Arabia is so far away. That's part of it. And the other part of it is Islamists have done such a good job with their propaganda. And mm -hmm. any time a man or a woman, a feminist, a, a critical thinker, a, you know, an intellectual, anybody tried to speak up and make these arguments that I was making, they, the, they had already poisoned the landscape with this idea that if you criticize any of these things that you know very dearly need to be criticized, that makes you a bad person. That makes mm -hmm. you Islamophobic, xenophobic, racist, blah, blah, blah. And you saw that happen so perfectly in that little microcosm that you um, referred to, which was when Ben Affleck just jumped <laughs> to the rescue of the brown people when these two men were trying to have a perfectly rational intellectual conversation. There was no racism involved. He was out of his league. Speaking up. Yeah, he was yeah. out of his yeah. Like the, I think Sam Harris was talking about Islam is the mother load of bad ideas. So he was in the ideas realm. He's talking about ideas. Yeah. And Ben Affleck's response was, it's just like you're saying you're dirty Jew. It's like he brought hum humans into it. It's like, Mate, I'm talking about ideas here. Um, yep. uh, do, you, do you think it's a question here for you? Uh, uh, Christopher Hitch is one of the people who influenced my life so much. Um, and uh, I, I tracked him. I've done uh, I've almost a biography in, in Arabic on my channel because I, I was fascinated mm -hmm. by the man. And I saw his transition. He used to be a very, you know, in the social party, a communist by heart. Yeah. And you can Mark, see, yeah, yeah he's, you, can, you can see he is he's transitioning and he's yeah. seeing the problem and almost to the way to the point where um most people attacked him that he actually changed camps to and he's on a right winger now after his support of the iraqi war um i think i might disagree with him on that one here but i agree with him on everything um 
and um, it seems like he sensed something in within the the left um, uh, group that there is uh, a deviation from the manifesto from the original creed because it started as an atheistic necessarily atheistic philosophy um, uh, mm -hmm. to now to say well oh, oh yeah you can you can criticize why Jesus, the one with the blue eyes, mm -hmm. but when it comes to the people of color, because of in, uh, the history of imperialism, you've got to somehow get that cognitive dissonance in, in order and suddenly, you know, brown people deserve, um, uh, you know, give them a break. You need a break. Yeah. What do you think? Would you think Christopher Hitchens saw something happening? I, I totally agree with you. Yes. It, it was, it's almost prophetic, the, the kinds of things that he was saying well, he was talking about the term Islamophobia before it was even a mainstream term, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, he, he totally got it. He is someone like Sam Harris who really doesn't differentiate between ethnicities, races, religions. Like he'll just see what is right, what is wrong. And then he'll just speak on that based on how he perceives it. Um, and that's a rare thing, especially somebody who was a, a Marxist for so long, because mm -hmm. you're supposed to parrot the party line. You have to say what is, it's just like being a Muslim. It's just like every other cult, you know, you don't use your brain. You just repeat what everybody else says, what you were told to say, um, and you're not supposed to think about it. And, you know, I think that, you know, he probably did do that for a lot of years, but you grow up. I think mm -hmm. a lot of it is just age, maturity, wisdom. You get to the point where you realize that um, there's the ideal world and then there's humanity. <laughs> oh, <no. And> there's, <laughs> that's right. You know, and, you know, and, and human beings are always going to be limited by the fact that they're human beings. And, and you can have all of these ideals that you want and all of these great ideas that you think um, humans should be. But at the end of the day, that's our nature. It, hopefully, you know, some of these things we can evolve out of them. And we are, you know, if you look at it, take a step back and look at the grand scheme of things, you know, humanity obviously is moving forward we really are progressing in so many ways um but you can't you can't accelerate that process you know like it has to happen organically people need time to uh, you know even being an atheist even that is so against our nature you know like we want to be with groups. We're social animals. Oh, true. We, yeah. It feels, we it feels comfortable to be part of a community. Yeah. Communi in a community, you feel supported. You feel protected. You know, like it it fulfills so many parts of us that are, you know, our nature. Um, and to be an individual and to say, no, I disagree with this because it's harmful, because it's wrong, you know, because whatever. Um, that is, again, it's against our nature to say, <clears throat> I'm going to leave this order, <laughs> this, this order that I'm living in, and I'm going to choose chaos. You know, I'm going to be, let, leave all of this behind and not have any idea who am I? What do I believe? I have no more friends. I have no more family. I have no more community. I have no more support system. And, but you choose to do that, you know, it's a very small number of people that actually can do that because it's against our human nature. It really is like it, it took, it took a lot. And you know, that's why Arab, I think a lot of people. Uh, the Arabic word for nature, like it's been used by the, the Islamists and Muslims and, you know, trying to pro, uh, promote Islam, uh, fitra and saying, well, if your nature is so strongly um, the compass is towards a God. There must be one then. Uh, and then they're forgetting that we are instinctually uh, and naturally uh, uh, thinking that the earth is flat. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have not evolved to see, to understand quantum mechanics or the large movement of celestial, large celestial uh, planets. We, we evolved in, to see medium uh, sized things and understand medium speeds. Uh, so our natural instincts are actually far from 
uh, objectively true, where there's a exactly. lot of decisions that. running around in the brain. <laughs> a lot of our natural instincts are very bad. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. No, I, I completely. And that's why when you look at humanity progressing, basically what we're doing is we are overriding our natural instincts and we're choosing, you know, to do the right thing uh, as yeah. opposed to what, you know, of course it feels great, you know, if somebody hurt your family or something, you just want to go shoot them in the head and then be like, eye for an eye, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> that must have been satisfying. But like, we can't do that anymore, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's it's all about taming our humanity and hoping that yeah. we and it's usually and so it's fine. So it's fine for a minute or so before you have to live the relive the traumas and live the consequences of your action. So it actually you end up opening a bigger wound, but you don't realize it feels great uh, as you kill the shooter of your daughter, but then you know you're gonna have to live with this for the rest of your life. Um, I've got one last question. The hour is upon us, and um, uh, and I'm, I'm going to take it to the. Uh, so we talked about the left, and now we're going to talk about the right and the reformation. Um, uh, uh, within. Sorry, I'm laughing at how the way you said the hour is upon us, like <laughs> you and Diana. <laughs> it is Georgian day. It is, yeah. <laughs> Funny. Imagine this is happening now. There'll be. I'll still. I'll actually still um, doubt my my critical faculties and believe there's like an angel. I'll, I'll be hallucinating or something. I I would not still believe. <laughs> um, but you know, so the, we've got now the, the 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 right wing as well, who've got definitely an agenda. There are these are the religious people yeah. um, who yeah. might have a, a belief or faith against yours. You know, Christians don't think Islam is actually a religion, um, uh, and then the Jews don't believe Christianity. Then that Messiah is not the right one. There's still another one to come. So the, the three don't even agree amongst themselves. Then you go within the religion itself, and then you have the multiple six within the one religion, as you know, Sunnah, Shia. Protestant, Catholic, Hasidic Jews, uh, 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 cultural Jews, you know, atheist Jews, all these crazy uh, different labels within the one faith. And then you've got the, the pragmatic people, those who don't really have any religion, but are very happy to, to play the scene, to play you against each other, mm -hmm. just to to gain certain grounds. So you've got that right and left are, the left now is virtue signaling. They're trying to look virtually su superior. I'm the one who is going to save the planet. I'm the one who looks after uh, the poor, poor people. And then the right wing's like, no, no, mate, you gotta call it a spade a spade. The world is in trouble. We need financial stability. And the normal people are, are torn. Where, where do they go? How can they satisfy their super ego and their um, uh, their values? And at the same time, this is a life. We need food on the table. We need to make ends meet. How do you reconcile the two? Then comes in the middle a movement called the Reformation of Religion. Uh, superficially shows the West a certain uh, version of Islam, while in 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 secret rooms and with amongst themselves, they have their own version for the 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 real use. How do you see the normal Muslim or a religious person who's trying to be to pray, but go to work and maybe have the odd beer, you know, celebrating the win of their sports club? How can they fit in in, in such a crazy world? Yeah, no doubt it's very difficult, but it's very difficult from within their own community first, you know? So um, I'm a founder of an organization called Clarity. So Champions for Liberty Against the Rise of Islamist Tyranny. And I'm a co-founder along with Muslims, ex-Muslims, Christians, Jews, you know, everybody, atheists. Um and the Muslims that we work with are the ones that you describe right now, the ones that believe in liberal values, the ones who, you know, have an honest reckoning with their religion and say, this religion is full of, it treats women horribly, it treats gay people horribly, it's full of violence, you know what I mean? Like they're willing to actually not the kind of people that you described, which are the apologists, which that's mm -hmm. probably the vast majority of them, um, which will try to deny all of the things that are in the religion <clears throat> or to 
excuse it or somehow say, oh, context, or you have to read it in the historical blah, blah, you know, just trying to excuse it away versus look at the writing on the wall in front of you and just like accept the truth. It's, it's a difficult thing for them to do. Um, but the thing about the Muslims that work with us is they are hated and treated in the most vicious manner by their fellow Muslims more than anybody else, mm -hmm. you know? So they have, don't even, like for me, <clears throat> Muslims have nothing but just hate for me, right? But with these guys, they are scared of them because mm -hmm. they really feel like you are within, <laughs> you are within the community you know, and you're speaking <laughs> as a Muslim. Yeah. So they really, um, yeah, they, they really sense, they really try their hardest to tear these people down. Uh, in Canada, we had a Wilfrid Laurier University. It was funded by the Canadian federal government to create an Islamophobia, you know, list, some sort of, um, I can't remember what they called it. It's basically this manifesto where they talk about like all of the different sources of Islamophobia in Canada and how we can fight them. And they literally had a list of reform Muslim people, like good people, like Raheel Raza is a woman that I greatly admire. I mean, when I, I, I couldn't stop crying when I met her. She's a Muslim woman from Pakistan who fights for the lives <laughs> of, of Muslim women and men, but Muslim people to be able to live in freedom, which is really difficult when you're from Pakistan, right? <laughs> like people there, as soon as you say one word that just slightly deviates from the, you know, the most extreme definition of the religion, then they immediately call for your death. Mm. Um, so she, you know, she has a very difficult job. They all have very difficult jobs but they know that they have to do it. They're compelled to do it. They're compelled to, there's critic, um, sorry, what's the word I'm looking for? Clerics, clerics within the Shia mm -hmm. um, Islam as well, because Shia Muslims follow their, they, they revere their clerics in a way that Sunni Muslims do not. Yeah. Yeah. Sunni Muslims don't even care who's the Imam, who's the Sheikh, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna go to Quran and Sunnah. Mm -hmm. But the Shia, they follow their clerics. And so if they, are following a cleric with an open mind who's, you know, uh, liberal minded, then like yeah. the constituency, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. His followers will become that way too. So it's happening. It's happening in the same way that the women in all of these countries are fighting against, you know, they're trying to criminalize domestic abuse. How do you do that when the Quran has already made it halal, right? It's a difficult job. They're trying to increase the age of um, marriage for children. How do you do that when your prophet married a six-year-old? You know, like they've got they've got a big fight ahead of them. In my opinion, it's putting lipstick on a pig. You know, that's that's where I see it because I would never spend my time and energy trying to reconcile. You know, but Allah said that men can beat their wives. But I think that we should make it. Uh, you know, criminal. See, it's like lips, it's, lipstick you know, on waste a pig. Your time with that. Lipstick yeah. on a pig. Yeah. That you know that that phrase that will uh, get you about two million views on TikTok these days. You know, and uh, having, uh, <laughs> honestly, we we live in a different world. You know, P people are uh, motivated by different things. But here's a follow up question: um, uh, Judaism uh, and Christianity have books, obviously not the way Islam understand them because they were not. Uh, given by Gabriel to Jesus and Moses, they're a completely different story. The, mo the, the, the very intelligent Jews and educated Jews and Christians, they understand that these were inspired stories. Uh, yes. And they're not to be understood exactly literally, you know, unless you're a fundamentalist. Uh, Quran is a different story altogether. This is supposed to have been written word for word before humanity and the universe were created. How would you get around that? How do you reform that? The infallible word for word. How do you, what do you do? 
I mean, hadith is all full of shit and full of crap. You yeah. get rid of that, but the Quran itself is full of rubbish too. What do you do? Yeah. How do you do you re-explain it? Do you keep the words and say, well, hit here at Rabahunna doesn't mean really the hit, it means uh, you know, a, uh, tickle, tickle them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true thing that the <laughs> apologists did say that. To this. <laughs> yeah, that's what they do. They just they just straight up lie. Like you said, the the Hurain are great. Adrabuhana means tickle them. You know, uh, Aisha wasn't six; she was eighteen. You know, they just come up with whatever bullshit, and it, it, it's like um, that's why I'm saying it's lipstick on a pig because. You're covering one lie with another Sorry. lie. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. I just, in in my opinion, I feel like obviously the whole thing needs to go in the garbage, but I wouldn't put my time and energy into doing what, what you're asking, but I support the people who are willing to do that, who, because at the end of the day, they are the Muslims that I want to have as my neighbors or in school with my daughters or you know what I mean? Like they're, they're the, those are the Muslims I would like to be around. I don't want to be around the ones that actually take their book literally, you know? So I'd rather be around cherry picking dishonest ones. Reminded me of a scene from super bad McLovin, you know, the, the, the little kid wanted to get a fake license to, to, to get to alcohol. And he, he had a, just one name, the first name and McLovin. And he was 25 years old. And John Hill said, why did you say you're you know, 18? He said, mate, everybody used to, or 21 in America, obviously not 18. So everyone who wants to fake a license always have the age of 21. How many 21 years old do you think there's around? It's good. So it's uncanny that the Muslim will pick the, the age of consent to be the age of Aisha. They should have said 17 or 19 to make it a bit more believable, but it had Very to be <laughs> <laughs> so they they felt. I mean, McLovin had it made it better. I think had a better lie. <laughs> That's right. More plausible. But before I finish, do you would you like to add anything at all um, to this lovely conversation that I really don't want to end? But I, I'm, I know you're you're in Europe, and I want you to 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 you know to to shop for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm actually really excited about the channel that you and Adam are going to start. I'm really excited about that. I loved this conversation. I love the conversation I had with Adam. My Arabic is really, you know, uh, I struggle <laughs> to speak in Arabic as I yeah, used to be fluent in it. But um, I'd love to join you guys when you have that show That's going on. Long. That's I'm brilliant. so happy to see that it's expanding into the Arabic speaking world because, of course, we have Sharif Gabit. We have so many people over yeah. there making videos and really great ideas and spreading the word. But it's difficult for them. You know, when you're living in a free country, you're living in a free Western, you know, kufar country, then you have that protection. You have that power. You have that ability to get these ideas out there even further. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm so, so proud of you guys for doing that. And I, I completely um, support you. And I, I just, I love seeing that. I love seeing the changes in Egypt. I love that so many Egyptians now are starting to, um, you know, resist the idea that we're Arabs, you know, the Arab Republic of Egypt, what makes us Arabs? We're in North Africa. What What are you yeah. talking about? Um, and they're even discovering that the Egyptian Arabic is actually the Egyptian language. It has a completely different grammatic formation than Fusha, you know? Um, so it's actually Egyptian. It's not Arabic. And I just love seeing the changes in the world you know i love seeing what's happening in iran i love seeing what's happening in saudi arabia that all gives me hope um what's happening in the west <laughs> it's like we're moving in opposite directions unfortunately um but yeah i just wanted to say all the power to you we're both you know we're both fighting the same fight and i'm 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 really glad to have you as a, a fellow soldier in this journey well, thank you so much. I mean, uh, honestly, the amount of work I was looking at, the different foundations you're involved in, from Ayan Halsey, I read, the, the uh, Richard Dawkins, so much work you do. 
um, you, you must have abundance of energy to be able to do all all the work you do. But I think all the built up of, of, of frustration and anger uh, is the size of an atomic bomb at this point. I think <laughs> you're absolutely correct. It's all the years of being told to shut up, sit down, lower your eyes, lower your voice. And now I'm just like letting it all out and nobody's going to stop me. So, yeah, you're so correct. That's brilliant. Uh, Yasmin, one more time. Thank you so much. Guys, the description of all Yasmin's uh, website, uh, YouTube channel, please go ahead, have a look and please donate to the charity because it does a lot of work. I'm going to do that myself and you're encouraged uh, very much so uh, to, to do um to do the right thing. Uh, thank you very much, Yasmin, and I will be seeing you thank probably you. shortly. And when we, uh, I promise you, you're going to be one of the very first guests to have uh, on on the show once once it's been established. Inshallah. <laughs> that is never going to happen. <laughs> no, <laughs> All right, folks. Thank you so much, Henry. Thank you very much. We'll see you later, guys, and we'll go with the outro. I'll use the English outro.